say good morning and welcome to Conowingo Baptist Church. Uh, I'm very thankful and blessed to see everyone here this morning and I appreciate you coming out on this day to join together uh, with the family of God to worship Jesus Christ as our personal and collective Lord and Savior. Uh, we will always and forever praise His name and lift Him up on high for who He is and for what He has done for every single human being who's ever lived. And our God is an awesome God, and we praise Him. Amen. So if you are a visitor today, if you look in the pew in front of you, you're going to see a little card that says, Welcome. You can take that out, open it up, and you're going to see a little card inside of there. And you can fill that little visitor's card out. And when the offering plate goes around later on in the service, uh, you can actually just put that card, that information card, right in the offering plate when it goes around. And then we'll follow up with you in the next two or three weeks just to see what God's doing in your life. Uh, I also offer something, we offer something called Pizza with the Pastor. So uh, Cotton Wingo Pizza is right around the corner. If you just want to sit down and talk about what's going on in your life, and, and I'll treat you to some pizza or whatever it is you want there. They serve everything there. You have caviar and all sorts of stuff. Not really much. But, uh, but I, I, love, I would love to sit down and talk with you be very open about what do we believe, uh, why do we exist, and, and what can we do to serve you and to, uh, to build that relationship with Jesus Christ. The Deacon of the Week this week is Brother Raymond McKinney. And uh, Raymond McKinney, what that means, what we do for the Deacon of the Week, is you and I have uh, physical needs. We have things that go on in and around our lives. A water bill, electric bill, um, things that may have broken in the home and we just aren't able to fix or aren't able to work on. Uh, maybe you have a neighbor who is struggling with certain areas of their life, their daily life, and uh, it's something that we can help out with. So you just give the church a call, and then we'll coordinate through the Deacon of the Week that week to ensure that we go out, check out the area, see what we can do to help out, and then we do. And then we have a whole uh, fund, it's called Benevolence Fund, and we use that Benevolence Fund to fill those needs. And so this week at Call the Church, I'm going to go through our Deacon brother, Raymond McKinney. Um, we want to say thank you so much for those who helped out last week with the youth luncheon. Um, it was very successful in regard to the generosity. You as a church were extremely generous. $806 donated last week just at that luncheon. So, now that's on top of the regular offering, the, uh, the Lottie Moon that we're going to do, a Lottie Moon the Mission March here in a moment. Um, that's on top of all that. And so to understand um, that you're being so obedient and faithful in the giving, uh, I, I appreciate that and the youth appreciate that. What that means for them um, is that a lot of the youth we have were just flat out unable to uh, pay for retreats, camps, literature, things like that. They, they don't even, we don't even have to go to them. We don't have to burden their parents by asking. Uh, there's going to be things that they are flat out uh, going to be able to go into by your love. And so thank you so much. That means the world uh, to these kids. And so, uh, so we love our children. We love our youth. And so what you just saw, Sparky just came up here. Our brother Sparky just came up, dropped the big basket here. Uh, we're going to do a mission march here in a moment. And uh, our Lottie Moon mission offering, this is why it says uh, go into all the world. The Lottie Moon Mission Offering, so this is a Southern Baptist church. What makes this church different than the church across the street or whatever is every Southern Baptist church volunteers. So it's, we, we're, we have the freedom and choice to do this or not. Nobody tells us we have to. We have the freedom to join with every other Southern Baptist church around the world. And we volunteer to say we're going to take an offering, and we do it twice a year. This offering is for those church plants and those missions all around the world. So we partner with every other Southern Baptist church, and every dollar, every penny that goes into this basket goes and collects all around the world. And this goes into missionaries' hands all around the world. Not just here in the United States, we take a whole other offering for that. But this is just for those missionaries all around the world. And so we partner together, all of the churches partner together. And so kind of we go Baptist Church, we don't support one missionary, we don't support ten, we don't support fifty, we support thousands of missionaries by partnering together with the collective body of Christ all around the world. And so this is what we're going to do. So in a moment we're going to have everybody stand up. I've got a couple more announcements, just kind of get your mind ready. 
In a moment, we're going to stand up together. Everybody's going to stand up, and everybody's going to come forward. Even if you have no money to give into the basket, that's perfectly okay. And God knows that. It's between you and the Lord. If you have nothing to give, you can pray over that offering. <laughs> and as you come up and you've got nothing to give, you pray over that offering that whatever that those who do have, that God would give and God would, would allow them to give generously. And for those who don't, that we pray, God, you use it. Even if we do have, obviously, we are praying, God, use every single penny to get the gospel out. Let that final person receive the word of God and be transformed by the gospel. And so that's what we're going to do. That's what the Mission March is all about. We'll all get up together. I'll, I'll ask you to kind of join in the middle uh, in your pews. We'll kind of join the middle down this aisle. Every single person comes up, pray over it, give what God uh, tells you to give, and then kind of go out and go back to your pew where you're sitting. And that's what we're going to do for the Mission March. So just as you're praying about that and, and getting that ready. Um, up here as well, you're going to see uh, these church uh, directory. We're doing a church directory. We've got sign-up sheets for Friday, this coming Friday and Saturday. Um, still lots of spots available. There's over 100 people that have signed up, 103, 107, something like that, are signed up to take photos, which we praise the Lord for that. But even if you're not a member, so let's say you're just visiting here for the first time. If you're not a member, you're just visiting, um, you can come up and you can get a free photo. We'll give you a free 8x10. You show up on this day with your family and whoever you want, and we will take your photo. You will get a free 8x10 photo. No questions asked. Uh, we invite you to do that. We want you to do that and have a free photo for your family. If you're a member of Conway kind of Baptist Church, you're going to get the free photo. You're going to get opportunity to have access to an app that will plug you in and link you in with other members of the church. Um, and so it's going to be phenomenal. It's also going to be completely free to you, free for the church. And so if you want to get more photos, you're welcome to do that as well. So uh, if you want to do different poses and all that, you're welcome to do that. Uh, we've had a couple of church, uh, like so, not church, but we have a couple of Bible covers that have been donated, so it's completely free. They're in the library. You just go look at the desk, right through those doors, over to the left. Go in the library, check them out. If you need a Bible cover, you're like, I, my Bible cover's messed up. I need a new one. Go check it out. They're free. Just don't trample people. Um, <laughs> that's right up there. Uh, this is, so this is a real need. Um, we have uh, we have an Awana ministry. This is a children's ministry. We, we bring kids in every week. We teach them the Word of God. We allow them to uh, to have access to the Word, and we try to teach it to them that they can memorize it. The kids do memorize it. Incredible impact in their life. But every week, when we bring these children in, a lot of them are not with their parents. A lot of them are just kind of coming in, and we're busing them in, and Ron does a great job with that, uh, going out in the van and, and picking these kids up. But we feed them every week. Every week, we do a phenomenal job. Jim, Sheila, all those who help out with the, with the food. And I'm talking... They feed us. Like, it is delicious. They're super, they've done a great job of, of being very careful with what they're spending, but they put, you know, what they're cooking, the, the main ingredient is love and, and, and a passion for these kids. And so they're asking uh, just to kind of help to continue to keep things, uh, you know, frugal, uh, that we can, if you are able to donate food, uh, just contact the church, say, I want to help. This is, you know, I don't really feel like I'm, I'm that plugged in on anything. I don't feel like I'm doing anything in the church. If that's you, if you're sitting here, you're like, I want to do something, but I don't know what to do. Simple. Call the church. I want to help with a want of food. You go. You, they'll tell you exactly what they need that week, exactly how much. You just go and get it. You bring it back to the church, you drop it off, and we feed the kids that week. And we feed the adults too. Um, and that's an easy, simple way to get plugged in on something that's a real need. And I'm telling you right now, these kids, uh, and I, they've told me, so I'm not, this is not hypothetical, they've told me this is the best meal they get all week long. So if the church, if we as the body of Christ can provide that kind of meal and know that those kids are going to be fed by the Word of God, that spiritual investment for eternity, uh, what else more do we need to do? So, if, if you're here now, you're like, that's uh, that's me. I'm supposed to do that. Man, call the church. Let us know. We'll get you plugged in with Jim and Sheila. They'll tell you exactly what to get. So, just so you know where we're at with this mission march. Um, our goal for our church is $6,000. We've got to the end of the month to hit this goal. So far, through the generosity and the movement of the Holy Spirit, we have received $5,555. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Which means we have $445 left to give. I believe if everybody in here, you've been praying about it, the Spirit's been moving, everybody in here gives exactly the amount that God has told you to do. Every member in here gives exactly what God told you to give. 
and we get and we receive the prayers of those who are unable to give, I believe beyond a shadow of doubt, we're not just going to hit the goal, we're going to blast right, right through it. And so, so that's what we're going to do. So I'm, I'm, we're going to have a time right now. Uh, I'm just going to ask you to stand up. We're going to have a prayer collectively for this mission march. And then I will say, uh, move or go and stuff like that. And then we will come together in the center aisle and come forward for this mission march. And, and God is going to do great things. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we lift this up to you. We believe that you have allowed us to be faithful. We're not looking to give the whole thing right now because faithfully, God, we've been trying to give to you every week. But we believe in what's happening here. We believe in what you're doing around the world. And there may be chaos and rumors of wars and all these other things going on. God, we recognize what hour we're in. But we're not here to get involved in those kinds of discussions. We are here to stay involved in the kingdom work that you've called us to. And Father, that means sacrifice. We pray that as we come forward this morning to give to this Lottie Moon, we pray that you would allow each of us to sacrifice whatever it is that we have to give today. That you have set before us an exact amount. That you have set before every single one of us individually as members of your body exactly that which we are supposed to give and that we will give it. We pray for those who are not able to give financially that they would have the courage and the will to give prayerfully. That they would be obedient to the will that you've asked them to do today. That we would all be obedient, no matter what the amount financially we're giving, we would all be obedient to give the will that you've trusted us with today. And that through that, the gospel will go out. Your name would be proclaimed to every tribe and every nation on every single bit of soil that you have created on our planet. That your word would go out powerfully and truthfully. And men and women would be saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have already won. Let us be obedient to your victory. We pray this and we believe it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so if you can, join in the middle aisle. Prayerfully come forward as the Lord leads you. Sing as we go. Now the song we go on the ground. Hallelujah.
Where did your go? Welcome and see how all things are. Here we go.
pray this morning that uh, each of us, Lord, in this congregation, will feel you in a special way. Lord, more than that, Lord, it will connect with you. And more than that, Lord, that hearts and lives will be changed with belief. Lord, I just pray that this bless these ties and offerings. We will use them to glorify your kingdom. We give all praise.
because you just heard the body singing about it. We're going to read the scriptures and see what God did about it. But today, you have the opportunity to understand redemption. The series we're doing is called His Story, and we're looking at the ministry and character of our God in the Old Testament. Before Jesus came to be a man in the flesh, He was already doing His ministry all through the Old Testament. The subtitle today is One Shepherd's Nails. We're going to be reading through the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12. We begin here in verse 1. We read together. Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days, before the difficult days come. And the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened, and the clouds do not return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble, and the strong men bow down, when the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look through the windows grow dim, when the doors are shut in the streets and the sound of grinding is low, when one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of music are brought low, also they are afraid of height and of terrors in the way, when the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper is a burden and desire fails. For man goes to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets. Remember your Creator. Before the silver cord is loose, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the well, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find acceptable words. And what was written was upright, words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and the words of scholars are are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. And further, my son, be admonished of these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we have read Your Word today. And this is the message that You gave to King Solomon all those years ago. And even upon first reflection, we may struggle to immediately even understand what you're trying to say. So we ask for your Holy Spirit because we believe that only by your Holy Spirit are any of us going to understand your word today. It's humbling that our human capacity is enabled. But it's breathtaking that you are able to speak to us exactly as we need to hear it, through your word. And that's what we pray, God, that this is your message and no one else's. In Jesus' name, amen. The first section we're going to look at here in the book of Ecclesiastes, the first section is going to be a hint of slowing down. A hint of slowing down. We read here in verse 1, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come. So keep this in mind as we're going through these passages, this first part in particular. And the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in it. He's speaking about, look, we need to remember these things before those days start coming when it is literally harder to just remember stuff. 
The word Ecclesiastes is from the Greek Septuagint, which is, we talked about this a little bit last week, the, there's the Hebrew Bible that was translated into Greek around the time, around this time of Jesus. And so Ecclesiastes, the word, this is the word that the Greeks used to translate a Hebrew word. But the Hebrew word is koalet. Koalet literally means preacher or teacher. It's somebody who stands over an assembly of people and teaches. Ecclesiastes 1.1 says, it tells us that these are the words of the preacher. And then it says, the son of David, the king of Jerusalem. So these are the words of Solomon. So we find a, a, a phrase that Solomon uses repeatedly in Ecclesiastes, the book of the message of the preacher or the teacher. He says in the very next verse in Ecclesiastes 1, verse 2, he says, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. He says this over and over and over again. The word vanity is emptiness. So he's like saying, emptiness of emptiness, all is empty. The emptiness that he's speaking about is specifically referring to meaning. If you have no meaning, the idea is that there's no fulfillment. In other words, our bull or whatever, or whatever it is we feel, it's never full. It doesn't matter what happens, it's never full. It's empty. And so he, he says in this book of Ecclesiastes, oh no, he's like, everything is empty. Everything is meaningless. And I don't know if you've ever come to that point in your soul where you see things that way. But if so, the book of Ecclesiastes is definitely for you. No meaning, no fulfillment. The words of any preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ can be defined by this exact same message. Life is empty and meaningless without Jesus in it. So too, the book of Ecclesiastes does a remarkable job of describing just how futile our lives are if this really is all there is. And so we come then to this final chapter. It begins with a reminder, remember now your Creator before the difficult days come. Remember now in the days of your youth. Do not forget about your Creator while you're still able to recognize Him clearly. You know, time has a way of robbing the certainty of simple truths in our lives. We are able to easily notice these truths as children, and yet we become numb and unaffected by them as an adult. For example, have you ever given a child a budding flower and watched as they are fascinated by its beauty and by its craftsmanship, and they can just stare at the flower? Or you've had a child bring a flower to you like he just discovered the space station. And they bring it. Did you see this? And then you watch the same adult grab the same flower. And they'll smile. And then they'll put it away. Look at this picture of the flowers. So there's flowers. Look at them. Like you did when you were a child. Do you see how the picture becomes no longer just a picture? You're, what are you doing? You're looking at details. You're noting the colors fade. You're recognizing how do they do that. You're seeing the middle of it. Maybe some of you are thinking about, I know, like I understand what this flower does. I know why it's shaped like this. I know why all the stem and all that's there. I know what's going on. You know when you dig deeper, look at you find, look at this next picture. Same flower, electron microscope. You know what's amazing is the deeper we find in something, the more we discover. Now this is what I'm saying. The deeper that we discover in the things that are around us, the more order and the more engineering that we find. The deeper we go into our existence that we can see. In other words, that invisible world, this is here all the time. That is always there. Every flower you look at, when you dig deeper, it will have something like this. But even more, there's so many things I want to show this morning. But here's the point. God did not intend for us to be fascinated as a child and grow dim as we grow older. He intended for us to get like this. To dig deeper. To say, okay, I'm showing you it's beautiful. What if you dig deeper? You find this. Incredible. What if you dig deeper? You'll find something more incredible. 
you will find the reality that there are there are things going on at the subatomic level where it, like things are transporting from atom to atom, and we have no idea how it happens, but we watch it like it transports. No movement, and it moves. We ought to be fascinated by these realities, but instead we live our life dull to them. Plenty of adults, like myself, have completely forgotten our Creator because as time passes, we've opened our minds and our hearts to absolute nonsense. And so the preacher warns to remember our Creator before the difficult days come. As we grow older, it becomes more difficult to recognize our God. Why? Because it's our world view that becomes strictly based on the physical things we experience. And if that's the way we live our life, where we are going to believe only what we see or only what we experience physically, then we know that as time goes on, just naturally, we become less proficient at receiving physical stimuli around us. That happens. And he says, you're going to come to a point in that verse, he says, where you just I have no pleasure in them. These are the years of our aging life. Literally, our systems begin to shut down. Metaphorically, our spiritual humility begins to harden, and we close ourselves off from even the need of a Savior. So let us read as the preacher describes this shutting down. And if you were kind of like reading through those parts, you're like, what in the world is he talking about? It, he's describing the process of your body shutting down, our body shutting down. Because verse 2, okay, so when the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened, and the clouds do not return after the rain. He's describing the years of the youth. So understand, if he's describing the years of the youth, he's saying, remember your creator before these things change, which they will when we get older. So as we get older, our vision diminishes. The sun, the moon, all the things grow dim. Not only do the details of life become blurred, literally, but so too the brilliance of the colors begin to fade as well. We experience as we grow older, our pupil gets smaller. It's less able to react quickly to light. That's why when we get older, it's harder to drive at night. Our pupils don't want to dilate. We do this, they literally stay smaller. Your pupil is like the window that allows light to go into the optic nerve, to send signals to the brain. If you've got a smaller window letting light in, you're not going to be able to see as much. You're not going to be able to interpret as much. We lose our peripheral vision. That's this out here. Literally, as we get older, we get narrow focus. We have decreased color vision. There's color cells in our retina, and they are lost as we age. go away. The, there's cells in our retina that, that pick up color. They go away. Colors are literally less bright, and it's harder to distinguish between various shades of color as we grow older. What all this means spiritually is that the light of the gospel becomes harder for us to understand as we age. Our hearts become hardened to truth, which earlier in life were just simple and easy to comprehend. Sin, shame, guilt. Simple when you're a kid. Do you ever see a kid and they're caught doing something? What do they do? They hang their head and feel bad. The last time you sinned and you knew you sinned against God, what did you do? What did I do? Hope the church answered. We repented and we prayed and we asked God for What did we really do? Most likely. We looked to see if we got caught, and if we weren't caught, we either kept doing it or we walked away. Sun and light, moon and stars darkened, the clouds immediately returned after the rain. Um, that's an idea. So when the clouds begin to return immediately, so it just got done raining, and here you see the clouds coming again. As we grow older, we understand that phrase, man, it was one thing after another. It seems to take on this whole new meaning, because one body system begins to break down in us, and so we have another body system that's trying to compensate for that breakdown. And over the years and over the decades, that system that's compensating, it breaks down. So this is broken down. This breaks down. That breaks down. And I can't. This hurts. That hurts. I just want to chair. What is going on? I think I'm getting old. Our room smells like Ben Gay. All those late night TV commercials were like, that's actually not sounding so bad. <laughs> Those hurt when I sit down. <laughs> they look happy. <laughs> the tail of one storm is the head of another coming on the horizon. <clears throat> the recommendation from the preacher is to remember our creator before his light seems like darkness. 
before our felt, our help gives no more room for peaceful meditation upon the facts of the gospel. When you're young, you ever just sit there and like just enjoy being outside, hanging out? Or you just enjoy relaxing and looking? Like when you're old, that doesn't happen as much anymore because you sit and you're in pain. <laughs> you're thinking about the next doctor's appointment. He's saying, remember this while you're young, while you're just out there running free and doing circles in the grass, whatever young people do. It's great. <laughs> it's like, remember it then. Because when you're older, that time to just meditate and just enjoy and be happy, but grows very slim, because oftentimes just relaxing hurts. Verse 3 says, In the day when the keepers of the house tremble, the strong men bow down, the grinders cease because they're few, and those that look through the window grow dim. <laughs> Four side effects of aging are also represented here. He says that the trembling, the house keepers tremble. These are the servants, the ones who are doing things. He's saying that the ones who get the work done are now trembling. When you get older, stuff shakes. It's harder to just be still. Spiritually, we struggle to hold on to solid doctrine as we get older too. If we don't have the foundation of the Word of God when we're younger, as we grow older, we get new foundations that are weak and frail. And they will tremble as we grow. The hunching of the back is what he's talking about. He says the strong man about it. No matter how strong you are, how big you are, you don't see any 90 to 100 year olds doing the world's strongest competition. They're not pulling buses. The strongest people as we grow older will hunch over and will bow down. Spiritually, we're burdened by the loads that we've been carrying all our lives. He talks about the grinders ceasing because they're few. The grinders, that's the loss of our teeth. Spiritually, we're unable to chew on the convictions from the Lord. Fourth, he says that the eyes through the glass grow dim. This is that dimming perspective again. We can't see anything new. And literally, as we begin to lose our vision as we grow older, we actually might become blinded, and we literally have to then just rely on our memories of what things look like. Verse 4, when the doors are shut in the streets, the sound of the grinding is low. When one raises up the sound of the bird, and all the daughters of music are brought low. The doors shut in the streets, you know, for the elderly, it's harder just to go out in the marketplace. It's harder just to go out and buy stuff. It's harder to go out and do things. There's some who, their heart would be here every Sunday, and just because of the processes of growing older, they can't make it to church. It's harder. The doors are, the doors might as well be shut because they can't get out and do what they want to do. Spiritually, we become shut off from the marketplace of our soul. We find it more difficult to simply hear and commute with the church. The sound of the grinding is low, not just hearing loss, but spiritually the struggle just to hear truth because it becomes muffled by all of the defects that sin has produced over our lives and our hearts. Previous lies and negativity clutter the ear canal that leads to our heart. When one rises up the sound of a bird, we sleep lighter when we're older. We are easily awakened. Spiritually, we have no peace when the certainty of death approaches without Christ. Why? Because the reality of our soul is left unresolved if there is no closure in relation to its otherwise irrational guilt and shame and sin. I'm going to explain that. If we do not have closure in our soul about the sin we've been committing our whole life, if we have no closure, then that means we're just living our life and deep in our soul, deep in our bones, we know we're guilty of sin and it has not been resolved. And now if we are living from a strictly physical perspective, so all we believe is the physical world around us, and all that, that's, if that's what we believe, there is, it would be irrational to feel guilty about anything ever. It would be completely irrational. No reason to. Why well, feel guilty? We're just going to go and be sort of absorbed back. We're going to talk about that later. But the reality of our soul is left unresolved because we know we're guilty of shame and sin. All the daughters of the music are brought low. This is decreased musical ability, but specifically the music it's talking about is singing. Singing praise. As we grow older, our voices change. It is harder to hit the notes. Spiritually, we lose the ability to worship through song. We can't hit the notes. We can't follow the melody. We can only feel the bass, which is perhaps the most crude form of any worship. And I'm not you know, going against the drums or anything like that. I love the drums. But worship is not about feeling anything. Say that again. 
When we go into places and the, the, the lighting is a certain way and everything is geared, it's, there's a lot of churches that are built on the premise, we want you to feel something when you're here. I want everyone, I want everyone to know that the Bible teaches us to worship in spirit and in truth. And when Jesus and the, the Word of God teaches us this, it does not say, I want you to feel something. Worship is not about us. It is about spirit and truth, and both of those abide solely in the Lord Jesus Christ. Worship is something we give because He's worthy. So you will not find in this church ever that we're going to darken things and set mood lights. And we don't want to manipulate you to feel something. We want you to give everything you have to the Lord Jesus Christ because He's worthy. Amen. Verse 5, Also they're afraid of height and terrors of the way when the almond tree blossoms, the grasshoppers are burned, and desire fails, for man goes to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. Afraid of height as we get older, there's a very real risk of falling. Spiritually, the inner structures of stability show themselves to be weak. If we don't have the gospel, the word of God, building us up in our soul, then as we get older, whatever we try to build ourselves up in will fall and crash down. Whatever we've been hoping in, whatever false gods and idols we've been trusting in, as we get older, we see they fail. <coughs> but the word of God never fails. There's terrors in the way. As we get older, it's harder for us to protect ourselves. We understand that our soul is completely unable to protect itself from death and hell. The almond tree blossoms. It's a very interesting phrasing. It's, it's, a, it's a picture of the graying of the hair. As that autumn tree blossoms, the almond tree becomes this white. It's this graying of the hair. So in order to understand this spiritually, the process of graying of grain can be explained. You've got a hair follicle, and inside that hair follicle you have these pigment cells that put in the melanin, and as that goes in, as you go, grow older, those pigment cells begin to die. So the hair just begins to come out just as it is, transparent, gray, white, silver. Spiritually, we lose that mental capacity to just infuse the simple truths that we know that we were born with. We have a soul, we need a Savior. As we get older, the simple common sense of our spiritual understanding. Children understand this, no problem. You ask an older person who's been an atheist her life, they're like, that's ridiculous. The hair comes up transparent. The grasshopper is a burden. Walking becomes a labor to the bones of those who, as we grow older, just walking hurts. Spiritually, we're weighed down and we attempt to be mobile in our joy. Desire fails. That means motivation just drops out as the world around us becomes dull. We're not motivated like we're. The world doesn't smell like it used to. I can't smell anything now. <laughs> Taste disappears. This is why cooking tends to get just hotter and hotter as we get older. <laughs> like, I remember I used to taste this. Maybe I just poured the basket sauce. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, taste. That's right. You know, spiritually, life loses flavor that it once had in abundance. The inevitable result of something that's winding down. Inevitable result. This should make sense to everybody. If something is winding down, what's going to happen? It's going to end. He says, man goes to his eternal home. That eternal home will either be separation from God, suffering in hell, or that eternal home will be fellowship with God and life in heaven. Every man and every woman will absolutely go to their eternal home. And the mourners, it says, go about the streets. Sadness, grief, pain will be left here on the earth for those who are dealing with loss. Why? Because loss hurts tremendously and for a long time. Those of us who are still left on earth after others have passed away, we are left with a real and lasting warning, even still. And this is the end of the concluding point of this first point. This is how the world operates. The preacher is giving us facts about what's happening in our body. Including point number one, the shepherd moves the sheep along. That's what the preacher's doing. He's moving the sheep along. He's like, look, as you're growing older and as you're aging, this is what aging looks like. 
I hope that at whatever age we're at, if you are aging above like 30, 25 or 30, you are recognizing that every decade seems to make these verses that much more true. If you haven't lost your teeth, you've had a real significant toothache. If you haven't lost your hearing, you've asked people, hey, what did you just say? If you haven't lost your sight, you started doing this. True. Section two, a hint of spiritual destinations. Where are we going? Where are we going? Things are slowing down. They're also heading somewhere. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loose, the golden bowl is broken, the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the well. Again, we see this phrase, remember your creator. Over and over again in Scripture, the people of God are reminded by God to remember him. Why do you think God does this over and over again in the Bible? The easy answer is, well, it's because we tend to forget. Why does God we tend to forget? The difficult answer is we want to forget our creator. That's the difficult truth. I see some of y'all are nodding your head. That's the difficult but true reason. We crave to be left unaccountable for our actions and our thoughts. We enjoy pretending that all those things God has done to us were somehow deserved or earned. We think, you know what, deep down, I'm a good person with a good heart. So I should be forgiven and allowed to live however I want. I've done what he told me to do. Our God would look at that statement, kind of like Luke Skywalker. You know, everything you just said was wrong. <laughs> Our God would look at that statement and he would say, remember your creator. If we were so good, our creator wouldn't have died for us on the cross. That we could have our sins washed away. There would have been nothing to wash away if we were so good. He didn't die because we are good. He died because he's good. <coughs> and he loves us. So here the preacher reminds us to remember God. And he does so by giving us hints of our spiritual destiny. He says the silver cord is loose. What binds us together will unravel. The golden bowl is broken. What holds our lifeblood will shatter. Silver and gold are both precious metals. Just as life is precious, however, the cord and the bowl are not permanent. They're temporary vessels. The pitcher is shattered at the fountain. It speaks of that which is used to draw water from the fountain. It's allusion to the similar image it's about to say, the wheel is broken at the well. So not just the bucket that goes down to get the water, but the wheel that holds the string that brings the bucket up. It's praying about what is it, God, that you're showing here? What does this mean? And there could be many interpretations, I suppose, but this is what the Lord laid on my heart. Our mouth and our nose will no longer inhale and exhale to allow that oxygen to go down in the depths of the wells of our lungs. That mechanism that pumps and allows our blood to go, that wheel that keeps the blood pumping and moving, is no longer going to work. Our heart stops. The great machine that God created to be our body will come to a grinding halt. Verse 7, Then the dust will return to the earth as it was. The Spirit will return to God who gave it two categories of existence, body and soul, temporary and eternal. The temporary dust is our physical body. It will return to the earth, just as God said it would in Genesis 2, 7. The Lord God, Yahweh God, formed man of the dust of the ground. And then we have the eternal Spirit. That's our soul. And God says it will return to God who gave it. Genesis 2, 7. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Some people say, well, that's just, that's just air, that's just oxygen. No. You can fill a dead body with oxygen, it will still be dead. If God is not breathing his life into it, we're dead. The life that God gives us in these bodies will exit one day, and it will return to the realm of God. And there's two possible destinations for our soul, as we've already said. Heaven, where God and his angels and his saints experience eternal life. Or hell, where Satan and his demons and all who follow him will experience suffering of death. When the human being considers the implication of such things, we too ought to conclude what he concludes in verse 8. Well, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanity. Everything is 
meaningless. If you and I are dust of the earth, chemically and biologically made up of the same atomic material as the dirt and the rocks, and these bodies are biodegradable and they're meant to just be absorbed back into earth, reused for future chemical and biodegradable dirt and rocks, and if that is all there is to life, then life is meaningless. I read some phenomenal arguments to the contrary. Some will argue, the main argument right now is the whole movie that's about to come out, it's about the patterns, string theory, all this stuff. That our meaning is to continue to perpetuate the cycle of life and decay. But in order to hold on to that theory, we must first deny every spiritual instinct that we were created with. Let me explain. If every single human culture around the whole earth worships something or someone, then we were built with an instinct to worship. That makes absolutely no sense, according to the theory of absolute humanism or naturalism. If, as they suppose, our only meaning is to perpetuate a cycle that exists by itself, then what difference does it make if you and I worship anything or apply value or meaning to anything, or if we don't? It doesn't matter. What difference does it make if we happen to believe in the cycle or not? What difference does it make if we waste our entire life fighting against the cycle or not? Zero difference. If we look at a strictly humanist or naturalist perspective, it doesn't make a difference what we do here. The cycle will continue. That is meaningless. And if you read the rest of Ecclesiastes, chapters 1 through 11, he basically describes all those cycles, all those things, and he says the same thing. It's, well, yeah, that's meaningless. Life would be meaningless if we were ever and only dust and dirt. Even if we become incredibly insightful and award-winning dust and dirt. Do you see? If the cycle will continue regardless of our actions or thoughts, our life is meaningless. However, if there is a reason that we all instinctively worship, then that implies value and purpose. The thinking man or woman deep down beyond that physical dust and dirt body knows and believes there must be more to life than ending up as decaying matter. To argue anything to the contrary is to conceive the reality of the purpose of life. <coughs> emptiness of emptiness, he says, it's all meaningless. These are the words from the preacher that beckon us, just like the flowers, search deeper. There's so much more than what we see. Verse 9, moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out, set in order many proverbs. We recall the preacher is none other than Solomon, the wisest man in history except for Jesus. You want to go real deep, the wisdom that Solomon had was Jesus through him. God tells us that because of this wisdom, Solomon taught people knowledge. What knowledge? The knowledge of God. It's the only knowledge that's outside of the meaningless, temporary, physical cycles. It's meaningless to spend our lives searching for knowledge and purpose without going to God. The preacher, Solomon, being wise, spent his life offering people an opportunity to understand God. He did this through his own personal search. He said, man, I pondered and I sought these things. He says, I wrote Proverbs, literally cracked the Bible open. He wrote Proverbs. Just like anything else in the Bible, the words will only be ink on a page if we don't seek the God who wrote them. What is God's message that he gave to Solomon that he wanted him to write down? He tells us, remember your creator. There could be some in here who have flat out forgotten our Creator. Concluding point number two, a hint of spiritual destinations. God says where we're going, but the sheep are, is the shepherd is calling the sheep. Um, the sheep are y'all can laugh. Hey, there's one of them sheep. Let's leave that here, sheep. All right. Bring it in. All right. Section number three, a hint of something different. A hint of something different. So this is what the preacher's been laying up, right? Things are slowing down. They're grinding to a halt. They, there's a destination coming for all of us. It's going to be heaven or hell. And now he's like, you want to hear something different? 
You want to hear something different than all the cycles and all the meaningless you see on this earth? Here we go. Verse 10, the preacher sought to find acceptable words. And what was written was upright words of truth. In response to an apparent actualization of the emptiness of a strictly physical interpretation of the things around him, he said he sought to find something acceptable. Something that was going to last. Something literally that acceptable. Something delightful. Something pleasurable. He was seeking answers for his soul. If we are the product of two separate but very real spheres of existence, if, if we are both physical and spiritual beings, then an answer for one will not be an answer for both. So in other words, if you have an answer that goes to bring your physical body some form of peace, but it doesn't answer your soul's need for a Savior, it's not an answer. If you look at your soul and you say, well, there's things that make me feel very spiritual, but, for example, something that may say, oh, I, I pray and I, I, you know, I'm a Christian now, but then you look at their body and you look at their life, and physically it's making no difference whatsoever. And that's not an answer for both. There has to be an answer that answers both. What was written, he says, was upright. Words of truth. He's talking about scripture. When he sought out wisdom, when he sought out what actually is going to last, he found the word of God. He found that one thing that had this ability to, to answer both body and soul. A body that spends its life living in sin, you can try to cover it with all the other physical things that you want, it's just going to leave us with more sin. Same with the soul. You can do all these spiritual things and all these nonsense that's out there. And you may, in your soul or spirit, feel something. But that's not wiping your sins away in your soul. That's not redeeming you for the sins that we've committed against a perfect God. So what possible words did Solomon write down that can bring peace to a body and soul that are destined for death and hell and decay? This is the most important verse in the message today. The words of the wise are like goads. The words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. The preacher compares the words not only that he read, but also the words that the Holy Spirit inspired him to write. He compares them to goads and well-driven nails. Nails we're pretty familiar with, goads maybe not so much. A goad is a sharp iron stick that was used to move animals along when they were stubbornly or just physically stuck in one place. Let me give you a picture. There could be some in here today that are saved, born again believers. But for one reason or another, we have become stuck in place. We want to grow in our understanding of Christ, but we just feel stuck. The Word of God comes in and brink, pricks us and says, you are needing to move. And we're like, that hurts though, and I don't want to go there. And he's like, sorry. <laughs> like, Alright. There could be some in here today though who are lost. And your whole life, you've been stuck in one place, trusting and believing in yourself that somehow your goodness or somehow your life is just going to work out, or maybe you've just rejected God altogether in your heart. And God today through His Word has spoken right to you, and He's calling you home, and He's saying, you are the one I'm trying to stick to. I need you to move. I need you to open your mind. Be ready to receive the direction I want you to go in. So who's administering the goads and the nails? One shepherd, it says. The same shepherd giving that sharp correction is the same shepherd driving the nails. 
You know what's interesting is the very next use of the word goads in Scripture is Acts chapter 26, 14, when Jesus is meeting Paul on the road to Damascus. So, that's, so you see goads in Ecclesiastes, you don't see it again until you find Paul walking on the road to Damascus, but God uses it the exact same way. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Jesus was telling Paul the same thing he's telling us today. Life is hard when we try to kick the shepherd. Paul was living a life where he was actively trying to kill and silence any mention of what Jesus was doing in his life. That's actively, that's who he was, that's where he was going. But Jesus, who is our loving Savior, met Paul just as he was. A criminal in God's law, a murderer in God's eyes, and he meets him on the road to say, why are you kicking? Why are you fighting? Jesus met Paul when Paul was rebelling against Jesus in his heart. Jesus met Paul even when Paul wasn't even asking Jesus to come and meet him. Jesus is like, you know what, I don't, I'm not waiting for you to invite me. What's up, bro? We need to talk. And how did he do it? He said, you're kicking against, in other words, what that means is Paul had apparently been prodded by Jesus multiple times. He'd be like, Paul, you're sinning. Paul, you're messing up. Paul, you're going the absolute opposite direction I'm telling you to go. And Paul must have been telling Jesus, yeah, but. I'm going to do this my way. Our one shepherd, Jesus, spoke through Solomon, and Solomon came to realize that Jesus' words are like goats. They hurt, but they're intended to get our physical bodies moving towards Jesus. But there's more. The one shepherd who also gave these words, he gave them like well-driven nails, he said, and the imagery, I think, cannot be any clearer. The Word of God pierces into us like a nail down past our bodies and into our soul. What does Hebrews teach us in chapter 4? The Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God has this great way of going right in and going right past all of our arguments and all of our clutter and getting right to the point saying, yeah, 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 I know I yeah, but you're a sinner and you need Jesus. And then it kind of comes out and it's like, okay, deal with that for a second. It's like, <laughs> that's the word of God does for us. And when we're fighting against God, it just hurts and stings. But we are left nonetheless with a very real impression. Did some training this weekend and got shot by an airsoft gun. It's awesome. But I was changing into my Batman pajamas because I'm a full-grown man. <laughs> and I saw on my leg, I saw this red welt. And I, it looked like a rash almost. And I was like, what is that? And I was like, oh, that's why I got shot earlier. I, I do pray that some of you are going to respond today and the Lord is leading you to respond. But there are going to be some of you inevitably, even though God's telling you, get up, come forward, receive me as Lord Savior. Jesus, I mean. Even though God's speaking directly to you, there's going to be some, and you're going to go home. And at some point later on in the day, God is going to show you the wealth. And he's going to say, you remember I was talking directly to you. <coughs> Don't forget. Every soul in the sanctuary ought to consider what's been presented here by Solomon. The God of the universe who created each and every one of us, breathed his life into us, died on the cross for us, and he wrote his words that would move us to truth. That the nails driven into us are reminders of the nails that were driven into his own hands and his own feet. Which, by the way, the final mention of nails in Scripture is Jesus <laughs> looking at his disciple who doesn't believe and saying, Look and put your finger in the print of the nails. It's the final mention of nails in Scripture. He did that for us. He took our sin and our shame. They were supposed to be left on us, and he took it on himself. The wrath of the sacrifice of God put it on himself. And then he resurrected for us, so that he could become a new well, 
with a new wheel with new water. What's the answer for our body and for our soul? How about a God who can resurrect both? Jesus resurrected in three days and proved that he alone can bring dead things back to life. This is the answer that all of our souls crave dearly. Who can take these dead bodies and dead souls and make them whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. He will resurrect our bodies and soul if we only believe and put our faith in the one shepherd. And that knowledge and that wisdom is what the final two verses tell us. This is the whole matter. Verse 13. Fear God. Keep his commandments. This is man's all. You can spend your life reading books. He says it's just going to make you weary. Your brain's going to grow and you're going to get headaches. You're like, I'm so smart and it hurts. <laughs> but if you die and go to hell, it was meaningless. This is the whole of the matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. Because verse 14, he says, every secret thing is going to be brought into judgment. Everything. Every single thing we've done. Every secret thought. I know God's speaking to me today, but I'm too embarrassed to do anything about it. God will judge. Do they really expect me to believe all this Jesus, heaven, and hell stuff? God will judge. There may be someone here secretly thinking, okay, well, God's going to judge me. I'm a good person. Psalm 53, 3. There is none who does good. No, not one. God will judge. In fact, God has already judged. He's judged us all guilty. That's why he came and died for us. This is why he came down to die and put our guilt, take our place on the cross, so his nails could be driven through his son rather than us. The blood of truth could be driven into our soul if we believe. And all we have to do is cry out, Jesus, save me. Concluding point number three, a hint of something different. The shepherd gives the sheep life. That's what he's wanting to give us all today. New life. Rebirth. Born again by Jesus Christ. That's what he wants to give us. For some of us who are already saved, he's giving us a chance to repent. He's giving us a chance to come to the altar and kneel. And be prodded and say, yes, I feel you prodding me. Okay. Okay. That's the sin you want gone. Got it. Okay. I haven't been fully committed to you or your church. You told me to and I, I knew I was supposed to and I've walked away. Okay. I'm coming home. Some of you have been saved. You've never been baptized. Going under the water. Going completely out of the water. God may be speaking to you, prodding you. You have been obedient in that. Okay, okay. I'm coming. In a moment, I'm going to invite you to all to stand up. Please stand up. We're going to pray. And you're going to have an opportunity to come forward and respond to the Word of God just as you understand it. Just as it was given today. You're going to have that opportunity to respond. After we pray, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for this wonderful book where you teach us the difference between meaning and meaningless. We pray, God, today that you would give us the strength and endurance and courage to participate in something that has meaning today. That as you are calling us to do things that are going to last for an eternity, that you would speak to our hearts, God, through your word. Remind us, you are our creator, redeemer, sustainer, messiah. You came here for us. Remind us, God, so that we can get up and go. Remind us so that we can come forward and just do what you told us to do today. Please, God, let us come. And if God is speaking to you today, we all are praying for you. Just come. In Jesus' name, amen.
God is good. The Word of God has a way of speaking to us right where we need, right when we need. And uh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Look around. Uh, everybody's come out today to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are here peacefully. And we are here to lift up the name of Jesus and all he's done for us. So, so thank you so much for being here with us today. Praise God. All right, so we uh, for our Lottie Moon March today, we got $1,191. Which makes a total of $6,747.42. gone to the foyer and checked out to see if you've got Christmas cards. There's Christmas cards there, so you may you may very well have one for your family, so check that out. And there's going to be a finance committee meeting Tuesday night at 6 p.m., so if you're on finance, please remember that. Don't forget to sign up for the church directory. We want everybody to sign up, every family represented. Um, let's sing together as we conclude the service today. TJ, if you could go back to that so come and be chainless, come and be fearless. <clears throat> oh, I'm repeating it. There we go. Let's sing out together. So come and be chainless. 